Could I now call on David Shearer, MP for Mount Albert, for his NZ perspective? Thank you. Kia Tato. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see so many people here uh, on this special day. Uh, special acknowledgement to our veterans who are here, um, and also, also to all the very a large number of very young people who are here on today as well. We're here to one of those who died and served to make our world a better place. It's a special year because it's 100 years since Gallipoli. And I remember a few years ago visiting there and being staggered, not just at the cliffs that we asked the soldiers to climb in the face of Turkish, uh, Turkish uh, onslaught, but also just the, the distance between the trenches. Um, if you ever see the trenches there, they're less than 10 metres. It was almost like shooting point blank at each other across, uh, across the field. Uh, you can only imagine how bloody and horrendous that campaign was. It was also a, a, a strategic gamble of World War I that ended in utter failure. It ended in our defeat. But out of that defeat, the courage that we as New Zealanders showed and our independent spirit came the realisation that we were a bit different from where we had come from, our colonial heritage. It marked the real start of our journey to nationhood. In 1914, uh, we were a much smaller country than we are today, only a million people, about a quarter of the size. Yet in World War I, we sent 100,000 men offshore to fight. In other words, one in 10 Kiwis, or about 42% of the male population of New Zealand between 19 and 45 years old, left to fight. 18,000 were killed, 40,000 were wounded. 58,000 casualties out of a total number of 100,000 who went away. Half of, every fam half of every family in New Zealand was touched in some way. And reminders of that cost can be seen right across New Zealand on the memorials showing those who died. And today outside there on the lawn, we've got 90 of those who died from just as small as it was then suburb of Mount Albert. Four families had two sons who were killed. And you can only try and imagine what that was like for those families. The impact of that war on our tiny nation was absolutely immense. And yet, 21 years later, we went away to war again. And in World War II, we had the largest, New Zealand had the largest share of its GDP devoted to war, the largest percentage of men in uniform, the highest percentage of casualties of any nation with the exception of Russia. We have paid dearly uh, for the wars that we have fought in. Yet we weren't really, if you look at the, some of the military historians, we, we were described by many as not really being very military. Uh, in fact, we were seen as rather anti-authoritarian, but as somebody pointed out, quite warlike. It was a lovely story it's a lovely story of uh, New Zealand General Freiburg, who was accompanying one day the British General Montgomery around some New Zealand troops, and rather a pucker, Montgomery said briskly, Freiburg, don't New Zealanders return salutes? And Freiburg said, I found if you give them a cheerful wave, they'll often wave back. <laughs> We've continued to serve with honour and distinction in our armed forces in Korea and Malaya, Vietnam, Timor-Leste, Afghanistan and many, many other places. That commitment has contributed to the character and the spirit of our nation that began at Gallipoli. Because sacrifice doesn't just build character, it reveals character. We put ourselves in harm's way because we live in a world where we can't simply remain neutral and uncommitted. Because when there are gross abuses of human rights, injustice, and forces that want to take us back to some dark age, we need to stand up and be counted. So we'll continue to play our part as a nation, but we will never forget those who courageously put their lives on the line for us to uphold our values, enabled us to lead the lives that we do and give us hope for a better world.
could I please call forward uh, from Marist College, Head Girl Georgia Kane, Deputy Head Girls Gemma Walsh and uh, Gemma Nash and Jessica Watson, who will give their perspective. The following speech was written by one of our history teachers at school, Mr George Bowen, who kindly offered it to us to read today. Tihei Mori Ora. Let us breathe life into these matters. What on earth are we doing here? About 2,700 young men died in an ill-managed defeat in Turkey in 1915. Not the first or the last time such a thing has happened. So why, in April 25th in 2015, are we supposed to remember, wear poppies, and get up at ungodly hours to attend services. In the words of Neville Chamberlain, why should we be concerned because of a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing? And yet, here we are. Funny, hey? Eh? It's not as if New Zealanders had a say in what happened. We were part of the British Empire which was part of an alliance system, which after August 4th, 1914, sent millions of European, Asian, African, and American young men to slaughter each other, killing nine million that we managed to count. All this, supposedly because an unstable Serb shot an inept Austrian archduke. Most young men, including our Kiwis, probably would not have given a toss about that. We didn't even know what we were getting into. Dan Durham, Wellington Infantry. So far, as it is possible to judge, there is no occasion for serious alarm. Prime Minister Massey, July 1914. Funny, eh? We were not even sure who we were at first. Kiwis in the Boer War worked out we weren't English, and their actions gave us our present flag which a few people today do not appreciate. The English just lumped us in with the Aussies and wanted to name us the Australasian Army Corps, the AAC. Then a funny thing happened. Our boys discovered not only were we not English, but we weren't Aussies. This realization may have come partly from fighting the Aussies over the girls in Cairo. But anyway, we were so certain we were not Aussies and protested so strongly that the Brits had to put the NZ into ANZAC, Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. We were not Australians. We did not choose to go to Gallipoli. Churchill tried to end the war quickly by sending a large army through Turkey to link up with the Russians and attack Germany from the Eastern Front. To do this, the Dardanelles had to be captured. It was a very good plan, which unfortunately underestimated the will of the Turkish boys to defend their homes and overestimated the quality of Allied leadership. Then blunder followed blunder. The key to capturing the Dardanelles was to occupy the heights above the Straits and then to shelter the Navy's access from the northern shores of the Dardanelles. A key high point was Chinook Bear. Simple, eh? English naval bombardments, however, wanted the Turks where the landings would be. Warned the Turks where the landings would be. So. so, the English and French got bogged down in the south. The Aussies and Kiwis were dropped off on the wrong beach and lost the chance to take Chinook Bear while it was, while it was undefended. All were pinned on the beaches and lower slopes. Not quite so funny. One man who analysed the problem amid this chaos was Colonel William Malone, a Taranaki lawyer in charge of the Wellington, Auckland and Otago boys. He built a series of trenches covered with corrugated iron which zigzagged up the slopes to Chinook Bear. He intended, he intended then to rest his exhausted men before planning an assault. The English, however, commanded an attack the next day. The Navy would bombard the Turks in the night, 
the Aussies would make a diversionary attack, and the Kiwis would take Shonak Bear under cover of the early morning darkness. The bombardment did not happen. The Aussies were pointlessly slaughtered, and at mid-morning, the Auckland boys were sent charging up the hill in broad daylight, being virtually wiped out. The order then came in to send the rest of the Kiwis. Not funny at all. At that point, a New Zealander stood up for New Zealanders. Malone defied the English commanders and refused to send his boys to be slaughtered. From that point, he was up for court-martial and probably a dead man. His men, however, stood by him. As Charlie Clark of the Wellington Regiment said, I reckon if they had tried arresting him, we would have shot them. Now in control, Malone made his own plan. They attacked at night, silently with bayonets. And so we took Shinnok Bear alone, under our own leaders, in our own way. The next morning, the British Navy bombarded Shinnok Bear and the Turks counter-attacked. Malone was killed, and the forces sent to relieve the Kiwis were driven off, leading to defeat and evacuation soon after. Left behind with 300,000 Turkish boys and 260,000 Allied boys. 2,721 of the dead were Kiwis. It was a bad year for the boys. Vic Nicholson of the Wellington Battalion's words scorch into the memory. I lost my best friend, Teddy Charles, that day. I thought I heard Teddy's voice calling for his mother and then for me. By then, the place was crawling with Turks and I couldn't get to him. He's still up on Shonet Bear, a pile of bones. Havoc and sorrow and distress don't make a good foundation for a better world. The fact is that New Zealanders were let up the garden path. By 1916, New Zealand soldiers themselves began the tradition of honouring these lessons and the memory of their dead mates. And in 1920, their pressure forced the government to make Anzac Day a public holiday to remember those lessons of Gallipoli. So here we are, 100 years on, honouring these lessons. Lessons which will not be lost or forgotten. No more garden paths. Don't let Teddy Charles last cries to his mum and his mates go on her. He wasn't being funny. So. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Thank you, Georgia, Gina and Jessica. Um, a very poignant reading and piece of work that you've shared with us today. I'd now like to call on um, Mount Albert Greener, head boy Isaac Akoi Akmore, and head girl Holly Fowler to come and share their perspectives. Thank you. Today we stand for those who have fallen, the ones who have paid the ultimate price for our freedom. As men and women who have gathered here today, we are joined by something stronger than love or friendship, but a bond that spans across the entirety of our nation, a bond of solemn gratitude and remembrance. In this remembrance, we are sealed together in a fierce union bond of the Anzac spirit. Anzac Day is an important part of the New Zealand culture. It is a time of reflection and remembrance of the unselfish acts and sacrifices of valiant men, young and old, who laid their lives down for our country. Today, 25th of April, marks 100 years when our Anzac forces landed at Anzac Cove, Gallipoli. Through tragic loss, we enjoy a free country, so may we never forget the importance of Anzac, its spirit and its meaning. From our youth perspective, Anzac Day makes me think about what I would be doing at that time in service for our country. 
and the courage it would take to fight and die for New Zealand. The bravery of the soldiers must have been immense. Today, we youth tend to take things such as our freedom for granted. We are not immediately surrounded by war and find it hard to imagine what it would have been like. Anzac Day is a significant occasion to remind us that our freedom we enjoy and our way of life comes at a costly price. It is a time to appreciate the sacrifice of all our New Zealand soldiers, both in the past and now, and to commemorate their bravery and personal sacrifice. My great-grandfather was a part of the 28th Māori Battalion, a young father with a wife and children who left the safety of his home to fight in a war in a land he had only read about. Having heard stories of his travels to countries like Crete, Greece, Turkey and Egypt, war can often seem quite glorious, but these stories also incorporate death, injury or brutal details of being captured as prisoners of war, like his brother was in Greece. So the concept of war and of Anzac made me reflect, reflect on my lineage helping me to capture a sense of my family, my background, and who I am today. The need to appreciate Anzac Day as a foundation stone for each New Zealander and of our, and of our culture is imperative to help the flame of the Anzac spirit live on in each of us. New Zealand as a nation was heavily involved in the war and our national identity has been built upon this connection to World War I and World War II. A century later, we stand as a proud, and modern multicultural nation as we remember the sacrifice and fortitude of our forebearers to fight for freedom, which is a basic human right that every human is entitled to. Anzac Day is a day of commemoration where we pay our respects where they are due for the thousands of lives lost in both of the Great Wars, for the biggest loss in one battle on the shores of Gallipoli, and for those who took part and continue to take part in the battle for freedom. Tomorrow I play an Anzac Clash match in my sport, Rugby League. The game will be played in remembrance for the many sports players that assumed their duty, those who fought, and especially those who did not return. We will remember them. The selfless act of our nation's fallen is an inspiration to all of us today. Despite this occasion marking 100 years since the tragic loss at Gallipoli, we can learn from the courage, bravery and selflessness of those gone before. We are grateful to those who have preserved our nation, our identity and our way of life. In doing so, we keep the torch of remembrance burning brightly generations later. It is in this commemoration we are gathered here today. It is difficult to imagine the, stru the true extremities of war. So remember, 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 the concessions forged by our forebearers has paved the way to the peaceful society we enjoy today. Anzac Day is a day of commemoration where we pay our respects where they are due, for the thousands of lives lost both in the great wars, for the biggest loss in one battle on the shores of Gallipoli, and for those who took part in the enduring battle for freedom. Today we remember and acknowledge the service and sacri sacrifice of all New Zealanders who have served their country. The values of courage, comradeship and commitment shown on the battlefields of the First and Second World Wars remain the foundations of our Anzac spirit. As we honour this Anzac spirit a hundred years after it was forged, we can be proud of those who served then, just as we are proud of those who serve now, lest we forget.